Hello, and welcome to the Tudor's Dynasty podcast. I'm your host, Rebecca Larson, owner of TudorsDynasty.com. Welcome to the show. As usual, before we jump into the show, I need to take a minute to thank all of you who have supported me through Patreon. I honestly could not and would not be able to continue doing this show without your support. Since the last show, there are two new patrons, Melissa S. and Megan B. Thank you so much, ladies, for your support and encouragement. I'd also like to thank an existing patron, Stacy O., for raising her monthly pledge. Stacy, I'm truly flattered. You too can support the show by going to patreon.com slash tutors dynasty. Just click become a patron. And for as little as $1 per month, you can show your support. I'd love to specifically thank those of you that are ongoing supporters of my podcast and blog. There are so many of you that I had to create a page of my blog as a page of thanks to you all. I'm flattered every time I look at the list and especially by those who have been patrons since the beginning. I am truly humbled. So with that, let's get on with the show. Sit back, relax, and prepare to be transported back in time to the life of Lady Jane Grey. We ended our last episode with the death of Edward VI on the 6th of July, 1553. In this episode, we'll look at the short reign and the end of Lady Jane Grey. On the 21st of June, 1553, the latter's patent was signed by 102 noblemen, London aldermen, bishops, archbishops, and councillors. This was pretty much every politician that was available. These letters patent were issued stating that King Edward VI heir would be Lady Jane Grey, the daughter of Henry and Francis Grey. Francis was the daughter of Mary Tudor and Charles Brandon. But before we go too deep into that, let's look at what happened before Edward became King of England. In the will of Henry VIII, it clearly stated how he wished it all to play out. It was evident that he wished to maintain a tutor on the throne. He had heard all of the stories about the War of the Roses and saw his father's paranoia. Henry wanted for Edward. Here is Henry VIII's take on the succession after his death. As to the succession of the crown, it shall go to Prince Edward and to the heirs of his body. In default to Henry's children by his present wife, Queen Catherine, or any future wife. In default to his daughter Mary and the heirs of her body, upon condition that she shall not marry without the written and sealed consent of a majority of the surviving members of the Privy Council appointed by him to his son, Prince Edward. In default to his daughter Elizabeth, upon like condition, in default to the heirs of the body of Lady Frances, eldest daughter of his late sister, the French Queen, in default to those of Lady Eleanor, second daughter of the said French Queen, and in default to his right heirs. Either Mary or Elizabeth, failing to observe the conditions aforesaid, shall forfeit all right to the succession. When Edward VI created his device for succession, he wasn't trying to overthrow his father's 1544 act, but he was merely trying to follow in his father's footsteps. Edward's device for succession was sent to Parliament just as his father's had. However, there would not be enough time for it to be passed prior to his death. If it had been passed, things may have turned out differently. Here is Edward's device for succession, or at least part of it. For lack of male issue of my body to the male issue coming from this female, as I have after declared, to the Lady Frances's male's heirs, if she have any such issue before my death, to the Lady Jane and her male heirs, to the Lady Catherine male heirs, to the Lady Mary's male heirs, to the male heirs of the daughters which she shall have hereafter, then to the Lady Margaret's male heirs, for lack of such issue to the heirs male of the Lady Jane's daughters, to the heirs male of the Lady Catherine's daughters, and so forth until you come to Lady Margaret's daughters' heirs male. There are four more paragraphs. I'm not going to bore you with all that. You'll just have to check it out in my subsequent article on this very topic. I just kind of wanted to give you an idea of what his device for succession had said. Anyway, It wasn't clear that Edward even had the authority to alter his father's will, particularly as Parliament had granted Henry the right to dispose of the crown. Even the Chief Justice, who was Sir Edward Montague, even he had a hard time believing that Edward's device would overthrow his father's 1544 act. However, with a bit of royal and political pressure, Sir Edward Montague was convinced to change his mind and was given a pardon for his attempt to stop the king's wishes. 
when the Duke of Northumberland informed Lady Jane Grey that Edward VI had died and that she would be his successor, Jane collapsed, weeping, and declared, The crown is not my right and pleases me not. The Lady Mary is the rightful heir. Northumberland and Jane's parents explained Edward's wishes to their anguished daughter. Jane accepted the crown as her duty. Declaring to them my insufficiency, I greatly bewailed myself for the death of so noble a prince, and at the same time turned myself to God, humbly praying and beseeching him, that if what was given to me was rightfully and lawfully mine, his divine majesty would grant me such grace and spirit that I might govern it to his glory and service and to the advantage of this realm. Here is part of the letter from Lady Mary that is dated the 9th of July, 1553. It was sent to the lords of the council, but arrived to them on the 10th. At the beginning, she discusses that she had heard of the death of her brother, the king, and how much it saddened her. Then she dives right into the issue. But in this so lamentable case that is to write now, after his majesty's departure and death concerning the crown and governance of this realm of England, with the title of France and all things thereto belonging, what hath been provided by act of parliament and the testament and last will of our dearest father. Besides our circumstance advancing our right, you know the realm and the whole world knoweth. The rolls and records appear by authority of the king, our said father, and the king, our said brother, and the subjects of this realm, so that we verily trust that there is no good true subject that is, can, or would pretend to be ignorant thereof. And of our part, we have ourselves caused, and as God shall aid and strengthen us, shall cause our right and title in this behalf to be published and proclaimed accordingly. Unfortunately for Mary, the preparations for Jane's proclamation were already underway, and the following day, Jane was proclaimed queen. It was between four and five in the afternoon, Lady Jane Grey, her husband Guilford Dudley, her parents and mother-in-law arrived by barge to the Tower of London. As the large tower gates closed behind them, a blast of trumpets grabbed the crowd's attention. It was there that two heralds then proclaimed that Lady Jane Grey was Queen of England. A Genovese merchant by the name of Sir Baptista Spinola described the situation as such. Jane was wearing a green gown embroidered with gold, large sleeves, and a very long train. Jane's headdress was white and heavily jeweled. By her side was her young, tall, and blonde husband, Guilford Dudley, dressed in white and gold. He appeared attentive to Jane's needs. Spinola was apparently close enough to notice that Jane had small features and a well-made nose, the mouth flexible, and the lips red. The eyebrows are arched and darker than her hair, which is nearly red. He also described her as thin and very small, even though she was wearing platform shoes to increase her height. He was so close that he stated her eyes were sparkling and reddish brown in color. Now that's really close. Unfortunately for all of us, that description by Sir Baptista Spinola was a work of fiction, literally. The first evidence of this observation goes back to a book by Richard Davy and Patrick Boyle in 1909, men who were obviously not present at the time of the event. Because of that statement, many portraits have been modeled after his fictional description. Leanda Delisle, author of The Sisters Who Would Be Queen, says that actual witnesses at the event reported that Guilford walked by Jane with his cap in his hand and that her mother was carrying her train. Now I need to take a minute to address the train carrying thing. It was highly unusual for someone with the pedigree of an English princess and French queen to carry the train of her daughter. What on earth did Francis Gray do to upset both Henry VIII and Edward VI to be removed from the succession and be replaced by your daughter? I have no idea. So if you know, please let me know because I need to know. After making the announcement at the tower, the heralds then moved to proclaim their message throughout London. From the beginning, there were many who felt an injustice had been done. A boy lost both of his ears when he shouted out that it was Mary who was the rightful queen and not Jane. The reception Jane received was a cold one, for the most part, after the proclamation was read. Here is part of the proclamation. Jane, by the grace of God, Queen of England, France and Ireland, Defender of the Faith and the Church of England, and also of Ireland, under Christ in Earth, the Supreme Head. To all our most loving, faithful and obedient subjects, and to every of them greeting. 
where our most dear cousin, Edward VI, late King of England, France, and Ireland, defender of the faith, and in earth the supreme head under Christ of the Church of England and Ireland, by his letters patent, signed with his own hand, and sealed with his great seal of England, bearing the date the 21st of June, in the seventh year of his reign, in the presence of the most part of his nobles, his counselors, judges, and divers others. It then goes on to explain the legitimacy, or lack thereof, for both Mary and Elizabeth. The truth was that Mary was a Catholic, and Edward and his men had done all they could to rid England of Catholicism during his reign. Allowing Mary to inherit the throne after his death was seen unfavorably. All throughout London, notices were being hung to announce the new queen, for those who were not present for the Herald's announcement. In the Nine Days Queen, Lady Jane Grey and Her Times by Richard Davy and Patrick Boyle, it says, From every point of view, Queen Jane's proclamation was ill-advised. It was very long-winded, even for that period, and the manner in which it dealt with the claims of Mary and Elizabeth, brutal in frankness, was well calculated to offend the Catholic powers and cruelly wounded the personal feelings of the late king's sister. As we continue with this timeline, we can't forget the Spanish. They were, of course, very interested in how things played out in England. Dated on the 11th of July, 1553, a letter was sent from the ambassadors in England to the emperor. It said, By way of news received since our last letter, we have heard that Lady Mary, in spite of the considerations we submitted to her, has caused herself to be proclaimed queen in Norfolk and is continuing to do so in neighboring districts both verbally and by means of letters. She has also written letters to the council, which they received yesterday, declaring herself queen. We have been told that when the letters arrived, the council were at the table and were greatly astonished and troubled. The duchesses of Suffolk and Northumberland, it is said, began to lament and weep. The council commanded my Lord Grey to go and bring in Lady Mary. They told him that he would ride out the following day with a good number of horses. As we now know, Jane's father did not go to get Mary. He grew ill with fits that would weaken him for months. It is believed he suffered from stress and anxiety. So in his place, Dudley's son Robert went to apprehend Mary. Now let's go back just a little bit to that part about the Duchess of Suffolk and Northumberland is most likely a made up story. There is no way that they would have been allowed in that meeting. In response to Mary's letter... The council wrote to her on the 11th of July, and they had this to say. Madam, we have received your letters the 9th of this instant, declaring your supposed title, which you judge yourself to have, to the imperial crown of this realm, and all the dominions thereunto belonging. For answer whereof, this is to advertise you that for as much as our sovereign Lady Jane Grey is after the death of our sovereign Lord Edward VI, a prince of most noble memory invested and possessed with the just and right title in the imperial crown of this realm, not only by good order of old ancient laws of this realm, but also by our late sovereign, Lord's Letters Patent, signed with his own hand and sealed with the great seal of England in presence of the most part of the nobles, counselors, judges, with divers others and sage personages assenting and subscribing to the same. We must therefore, as of most bound duty and allegiance, Send unto her said grace, and to none other, except we should, which faithful subjects cannot, fall into grievous and unspeakable enormities. Wherefore we can no less do, but for the quiet both of the realm and you also, to advertise you that for as much as the divorce made between the king of his famous memory, Henry the Eighth, and the Lady Catherine, your mother, was necessary to be had by the everlasting laws of God, and also by the ecclesial laws, and by the most part of noble and learned. The following day on the 12th of July, 1553, Mary traveled roughly 30 miles moving from Kenninghall to Framlington Castle. It was at Framlington that she really began to rally support. On that same day, the Lord Treasurer, William Paulette, brought Jane the crown jewels, even though she claimed she never asked for them. It was decided that her coronation would not be for at least a couple of weeks, so there was no need at the moment for her to have the crown jewels in her possession. It makes me curious why the Duke of Northumberland had not pushed Jane for a quicker coronation. Had the ceremony been performed immediately, there would have been no question who the queen was. She may have been considered a usurper, but she would have been anointed by God. 
When Matilda, daughter of King Henry I, inherited the crown of England, it took her so long to return to England from the continent that her cousin, Stephen, jumped at the chance and was crowned King Stephen before she had the opportunity to claim it. Things like that actually happened. This is the very reason the Duchess of Northumberland wanted Jane in London while the king was dying, so she would be ready. Why didn't Northumberland schedule an immediate coronation? It really makes me curious. So with that question in mind, I contacted my good friend Claire at the Anne Boleyn Files. Claire tends to know a lot about this time period and is generally my go-to person when I have nagging questions. Claire believes that a coronation took much time to plan, and that is why she believed it wasn't done immediately. But in my opinion, if they were worried, they could have rushed the plans and made it less of a spectacle. While the stories that are often told of Jane are of weeping at the thought of being queen, the truth is that she was performing the duties of a monarch, and every day Jane signed letters and papers with her name, Jane the Queen. If she was reluctant, I do not believe she would have signed it as such. I've always believed that she may not have wished for the role at the beginning, but once she was in it, she would fulfill her duties properly. For the next three days, Mary's supporters and forces grew. She gained support from men such as Sir Edward Hastings, Henry Radcliffe, Earl of Sussex, Sir Thomas Cornwallis, Thomas Lord Wentworth, Sir Henry Bedingfield, John de Vere, Earl of Oxford. I mean, these are such big names on her side, as well as many prominent families of Eastern England. Mary was proclaimed queen in various counties and towns due to her efforts. On the 15th of July, the tide really began to turn against Jane when the royal ships guarding the eastern coast for Queen Jane swapped their allegiance to Queen Mary. Their crews had not been paid, and they received a visit from Sir Henry Jerningham, grandson of William Kingston, that name should sound familiar, asking them to support Mary instead. So it was an easy decision. It makes one wonder why they hadn't paid them. Now, you probably want to hear more about these ships, I suppose. Well, perfect, because I just so happen to have some more information for you. A man by the name of Robert Wingfield accompanied Jerningham, who had heard about the ships off the coast by a drunken sailor, and the following morning found the ship beached at Langward Point. Wingfield documented what happened. Very early the next day, Jerningham, accompanied by Tyrell and Glenham, rode up to inspect the ships thus brought to Haven by the lucky tide and wind, as they say. When they had reached the Haven, he ordered Richard Brooke, the squadron's commander, a diligent man and skilled in seamanship, to be called to him, and took him to Framlingham Castle to bring news of this happy and unexpected arrival to the Queen. I don't know any more than that. They brought the commander of the ship to see Mary, and then the ship switched allegiance. Could it have been that Mary paid him the money that had been owed by Queen Jane's establishment? Or maybe she just offered to pay in the future? Either way, they turned sides. Also on the 15th of July, a letter was sent from a spy in France to the emperor. I always find it interesting to see what Spain was talking about during this time. The letter said, quote, The present courier, who is returning in haste to Italy, will only give me time to write a few words. But it will be enough if your lordship learns the most important news. The King of England died on the 7th, we know it's actually the 6th, and the wife of the son of the man who was formerly governor was suddenly elevated to the throne and took possession of London Tower with great pomp. The emperor's cousin retreated to some place in England. The said governor's son followed her with 300 horses, and it is thought that he will arrest her if he can. The said governor has written post haste to the king here, and if there is trouble in England, I am sure the king will not fail to help him with all of his forces, both from here and from Scotland. Within two days' time, he is going to send Monsieur de Guy, the French ambassador, and the Bishop of Orleans to encourage the said governor and offer him all the help he may need. There is some hope that this sudden change may rise to an alteration for good in religious matters. God grant it may be so. End quote. In the meantime, Jane continued to send letters to sheriffs and justices of the peace and demanded their allegiance, saying, quote, Remain fast in your obeisance and duty to the crown imperial of this realm, whereof we have justly the position. End quote. Jane was determined to maintain her role. The Chronicle of Queen Jane also reports that around 7 p.m. on the 16th of July, the gates of the tower upon a sudden were shut and the keys carried up to Queen Jane. Jane had ordered the guards to be set up all around the tower to help maintain her possession of it. A couple of days later on the 18th, Queen Jane began to raise more troops. 
She had been upset and sent letters to those who would betray her. She was sure that these rebels lacked the heart to continue on with their mission. She said these men should receive such punishment and execution as they deserve. But unfortunately, her show of force was too little, too late. The tide had turned and all appeared lost. While the Duke of Northumberland and his army made their way from Cambridge to Bury St. Edmunds to stand against Mary's men, the Earls of Pembroke and Arundel called a council meeting and then betrayed Northumberland and Queen Jane. The men persuaded many council members that Mary's claim to the throne was legitimate. With Mary now considered Queen of England, Jane, her father, the Duke of Northumberland, and Guilford Dudley were now enemies of the state. There must be consequences for usurping the throne. So the council's soldiers arrived at the tower and Jane's father, Henry Gray, was there to speak with them. They informed him that all was lost and that he must have his guards put down their weapons. He complied. They also told him that he must remove himself from the tower. And if he did not read the proclamation that Mary was his queen in public, he would be arrested. Once again, Henry Gray complied. Gray had the unfortunate duty of informing his daughter that all was lost and that she was no longer Queen of England. Jane gracefully held her composure and reminded her father that it took much convincing at the beginning for her to accept the crown. The Duke of Northumberland was quick to pledge his allegiance to the merciful Queen Mary as well. If this had been Mary's father, all those involved would have easily been executed for treason. Jane was moved from the royal apartment to a small house next to the royal apartments within the tower walls. Her husband was placed in the Beauchamp Tower close by. Northumberland may have believed himself safe, but on the 25th of July, 1533, he and his sons Ambrose and Henry arrived at the tower. The following day, his son Robert Dudley and William Parr both arrived as well. On the 27th of July, Jane was saddened to see her father arrive at the tower. They had all hoped that Northumberland would take the fall for the entire event. On the 29th of July, Jane's mother and cousin to the Queen, Frances Gray, paid a special visit to Queen Mary. It was at this meeting that Frances pleaded with Mary that her family were the victims of John Dudley, Duke of Northumberland. Mary agreed to release Henry Gray the following day, but Jane was charged with treason and had to stay in the tower. It was too dangerous for Mary to release her. On the 3rd of August, Queen Mary made her formal entry into London. With her was a procession of nobles and courtiers who took claim of the Tower of London. While this battle for the throne was shrouded in religion, Queen Mary made a point of issuing a conciliatory proclamation which promised a settlement of religion by common consent and said that people in the meantime should live under the religion that, quote, they thought best. This was a smart move by Mary. Most people were terrified that she would immediately return England to Catholicism. On the 13th of November, Jane, her husband Guilford, and his brothers Ambrose and Henry were tried for treason. The trial was public and was held at London's Guild Hall. Jane and Guilford were charged with high treason for taking possession of the tower and proclaiming Jane as queen. Jane was also charged with signing her name as queen. They were all found guilty as charged. The men were to be hanged, drawn, and quartered, and Jane was to be burned alive or beheaded. It was reported that Jane remained calm during the trial and sentencing. Jane was determined that her death would have meaning. During her time in the tower as a prisoner, she truly devoted herself to religion and found comfort in it. Eric Ives states in his book, Lady Jane Grey, A Tudor Mystery, that, quote, Jane faced imprisonment in the tower positively. The loss of liberty was irksome, but the more she could, by God's grace, triumph over hardships, the more confident she should be of her eternal destiny. Even though Jane had been condemned to die, there was no date given for her execution. It appeared at the time that her cousin, the queen, might spare her life. Unfortunately for Jane, the year 1554 brought trouble by the way of Thomas Wyatt and Wyatt's Rebellion. The point of the rebellion was to remove Mary from the throne and win it for Elizabeth, another Protestant, because Mary was looking at marrying a foreign prince, Philip of Spain. However, many believed at court that the intent was to place Jane back on the throne of England. But as history tells, Wyatt's rebellion was a failure. The only thing it exceeded in was the execution of Jane and her husband. A resident in the Tower of London wrote this about the day of their execution, quote, 
The Monday, being the 12th of February, about 10 of the clock, there went out of the tower to the scaffold on Tower Hill the Lord Guilford Dudley, son of the late Duke of Northumberland, husband to the Lady Jane Grey, daughter of the Duke of Suffolk, who at his going out took by his hand Sir Anthony Brown, Master John Throckmorton, and many other gentlemen, praying them to pray for him. Guilford was led to the scaffold where he said a few words, kneeled down, and said his prayers. Quote, then holding up his eyes and hands to God many times, and at last, after he had desired the people to pray for him, he laid himself along and his head upon the block, which was at one stroke of the axe taken from him. End quote. The same witness made account of Jane's execution as well. Quote, First, when she mounted upon the scaffold, she said to the people standing thereabout, Good people, I am come hither to die, and by the law I am condemned to the same. The fact, indeed, against the Queen's Highness was unlawful, and consenting thereunto by me, by touching the procurement and desire thereof by me, or on my half, I do wash my hands thereof in innocence, before God, in the face of you, good Christian people, this day. And therewith she wrung her hands in which she had her book. Then she said, I pray you all, good Christian people, to bear me witness that I die a true Christian woman, and that I look to be saved by none other means, but only by the mercy of God in the merits of the blood of his only Son, Jesus Christ. And I confess, when I did know the word of God, I neglected the same, loved myself and the world, and therefore this plague or punishment is happily and worthily happened unto me for my sins. And yet I thank God of his goodness, that he hath thus far given me a time and respite to repent. And now, good people, while I am alive, I pray you to assist me with your prayers. After reading a psalm from her book, she stood up and gave her gloves and handkerchief to Elizabeth Tilney and her prayer book to Master Thomas Bridges. She then untied her gown. The executioner went to assist her, but she adamantly declined his offer and turned to her ladies. It was after all that that her eyes were covered with a blindfold. The executioner knelt down and asked for her forgiveness, in which she willingly forgave the man for what he must do. She said to him, I pray you dispatch me quickly. Blindfolded, Jane was unable to locate the block in front of her. She had a moment of panic and said, What shall I do? Where is it? A person nearby guided the frightened young woman to the block. Her final words were, Lord, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Thank you so much for joining me. Until next time.